Alex, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, Chris. Pleased to be with you. Well, it's, you know, I, I, I get some legends on this podcast and they're not the people that most people would think. They're not the bloody superstars. They, I think part of, part of what we're going to talk about today is when you meet the real people underneath, you, you're talking a very different animal um, from, from sort of public persona and you very kindly uh, approached me to talk about your father and I said, well, couldn't we be helping the children, the, the next generation, if we talked about it in a podcast? Because um, look, it's several reasons, Alex, actually. It's also, I think it's good for me and you because we can hide this stuff we can, but that doesn't help. Oh, no, it, it moves us on a level. The airing, the sharing, but this, doing it with you, Chris, um, in this way, uh, very unexpected for me. I've no social media. I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a person who's out there in any way. I'm very private. But alcohol is a, is a social issue and it affects families. And I was a child... And my brother trapped in an alcoholic environment during our childhood. And it's not safe. It's not safe. And, and my dad died through multiple organ failure, a very predictable end in life to an alcoholic. No dignity, no self-respect, no love. And that's a very tragic end to anybody's life. I, I feel for him uh, as a serviceman. But I'm a child. I, I was a child. I'm a parent now. And he should have done better. Should have done better. Yes, it's that thing, isn't it? It's, it's called intergenerational abuse. And it becomes very hard to stop. Mm. Because we basically become a product of our parents, don't we? And the, the, Oh, yeah. You know, we, we, we... And I've had to really work hard on myself oh every day Chris I told you my myself and my brother being adverse to alcohol we both hit drugs we hit different drugs we both managed to stay alive thank goodness had we mm. picked each other's drugs we we probably wouldn't have um and so we could never drink <laughs> but luckily the criminality involved in my drug taking meant that there were very severe consequences for living that life. Um, and when I became a parent, it had to stop. I knew I couldn't justify criminal activity as a parent. Alcohol, you know, there's no blame. In fact, we live in a society in which you're encouraged to drink. I'm looked as, as weird for being a teetotaler on a work's do or on a Friday, I'm not popping off for a glass of wine after work. I, I'm not one of those who can't wait to get a drink in me. Um, I very much see it as a demon doorway to, um, to neglect for children. If you're a parent, I'm afraid I'm very judgmental about the effects of alcohol. Yes. And let's just clarify for our friends at home. And I can say this because I'm a... Um, fully qualified substance misuse specialist me too <laughs> yeah and i'm and like yourself alex i'm qualified from both sides of the fence so i've got 30 years experience if there's anybody out there that doesn't understand alcohol is a drug and it's not just a drug it's the worst drug the worst and right? look Chris, this is a very valuable point here I, I was a heroin addict for a decade I could get clean of heroin and never have to engage in a normal relationship with that drug again. Just mm. avoid it. I moved. I, I put everything in place. No one talks to me about heroin. No one tries to take me out for a bit of heroin on Friday after work. You know, I, I really think, look, food addictions and alcohol are the most pernicious because you, you have to have a relationship with these things in society. And what we're talking here, Alex, is where it gets complicated again is the massive hypocrisy involved in the British Armed Forces. Hypocrisy. Well, you can explain that to me then, Chris. Is, did I say hypo yeah, hi yeah. Hi hypocriticalness? Yeah, hypocrisy. Um, well, 
what do they do? They teach you for 22 years of your life to fucking hit hit the most dangerous drug out there at every single given opportunity. Mm. And then when you're dying and your organs are failing, and mm. this happened to one of my bezies, right? I'm not going to say his name, obviously. People watching will know, you know, go on. But when they're on their deathbed and their organs are failing and they've gone that horrible green colour and they're still trying to get out of the hospital because oh, yeah. they want to drink. Anything for a drink. You know, they're lying to the doctor. Oh, what it is, I'm going to go home and, you know, get me wash kit. And it's like, no, it's not. You just want to... You, you, anyway, anyway, this is not a criticism of, of, of the individual. It, it's a terrible psychological condition. But... When that person's in that state, you've got his military buddies going, yeah, mate, he loves a drink. And it's like, no, he doesn't love a drink. He's, he's chronically addicted. But this, to there's never, even to this day, Chris, is there's no early warning system, no one to this no. day now, because you must know people who are still serving. Is it still treated with the same lack of regard? Or, or are people actually helping each other now is it being addressed more now well let's look at the function that alcohol plays in the forces so medic self-medicating <laughs> there you go <laughs> numbing pain so numbing trauma that's a big big one bonding i would say is is an another you know all you boys together you get drink you puke up over each other you put women's clothes on and dance around and it and yeah, it, it, it works. It, 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 and for 30 of the lads in that troop, out of that 30, um, 25, it won't be a problem for. They'll get up the next thing. But for five that carry, I would say probably carry childhood trauma like, like myself, that release from that constant underlying feeling of being different or, or yeah. anxiety or whatever is just bubbling under the surface, which we, which we don't realize in our life because you don't know you're different from anyone that that self-medicating goes on to the next day. And then the next, or it's like, Whoa, when are we going to do that drink thing again, guys, come on, let's, mm. let's smash it. Let's, and, and you can see the, you can see the cycle of addiction start there so mm -hmm. and my mum picked my mum they were alcoholics together and so even when my dad left the forces six o'clock <laughs> six o'clock gin time I mean they were not brown paper bag alcoholics so when I was a child trying to I knew there was something wrong I knew there was something wrong it, it was not a safe environment but I, I couldn't put my finger, there was no crime. Um, it, it wasn't illegal. They seemed to be doing what everybody else was doing in such an overt way. Um, keeping to this timetable, this, this, you know, army officer, uh, you know, officer's mess, um, you know, even the types of drinks, the way in which they were drunk, um, this pomp, which covered, um, it actually, it, it allowed uh, uh, to mask um, this very evil addiction, which they were both into, but it all looked above board. It all looked, well, that's just what army people do. That's what army officers do. They just go for it a bit more with a, with a few different, <laughs> you know, it's, look, I remember a lot of officers mess do's, Chris, and things like that when I was very young everyone's drinking they're quite fun when you're little because ah, ah, ah. but then when you go back to a home and that mood turns sinister and then people start arguing or they don't uh, you know when the doors close you, you need your parents to be decent moral people and I see the drink um you, you know the movie The Shining Right. No, I, I look at alcohol in all the movies. You know, Jack Nicholson was borderline until he took that drink. You know, the, the drink changes people. Um, New Year's Eve, worst night of the year. 
oh, I can't stand it. I haven't been out for two decades. Everybody drunk, everybody neglecting everybody else. The, the atmosphere, people can't care for each other once they've had a drink. They can't look after themselves. Mm. And yet this is allowed to go on in homes up and down the country. Um, dis disgusting. And, and for me, there was always a slight class element in that my parents were deemed a, a bit middle class, you know? No one looks in middle class kids' doors or upper class kids' doors, you know? Social services only become involved in, in homes, you know, 20, 30 years ago, if there was some element of poverty or deprivation. Social services ever stick their, uh, their heads into an army, army quarters? Who was supposed to assess children's welfare for servicemen? Because mm. social services don't, don't seem to have much to do with them, do they? It's a private club. And so the children are neglected worse than they would be in open society. Yes. Do you, I get a bit not miffed. It's not the right word, but I, I feel for people when they use, they say, and I hear this a lot doing what I do. Oh, I was an army brat. And, and it's that self. It's. I'm trying to think of the right term. It's that self acceptance of a negative connotation, a negative stereotype to to try. Well, look, aban abandonment. I was boarding schooled for a few years, as was my brother. So, I mean, you're going to stigmatize any kid if you send them away. So, uh, you know, they're going to struggle with worth and value, uh, you know, if, if they're abandoned, aren't they? Yeah. That's what I'm getting to is, no, you, you weren't a brat. You were an abused child. Absolutely. You, you, you were moved to five schools before. You know. Oh, every 18 months, Chris, trying to chart and remember where I might have been living when. And just because my mum was living somewhere doesn't mean my dad was there. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so it's it can be very tricky trying to piece together. And memories, when alcoholics give you memories, you can't trust them. I haven't been able to speak to my mum and, and uh, as a source of information for decades. You, you can't trust anything you're told. The storytelling, they're shaping their own lives so they can live with the, themselves, editing as they go, and you become part of that deception. Mm. Yes, and let's remember when we're... we're, we're... We're having a go here, folks, or we're upset about the... Some people call it an illness. I say it what it is. It's a learned psychological condition. You learn that this behaviour gets you a certain reward. And for those of us that, that like that reward, because it covers over... Uh, the old Dr. Phil, you're getting a payoff somewhere, that yeah, kind of... Yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. We, we, we then chase that behaviour because we don't want to feel that bad way again. And then because the behaviour... But, but how could you, as a parent, Chris... I can't understand how failing your child would not be the worst pain imaginable to you. I, I can't, and I mean, and that's, I'd, I'd made a note. My dad had one job to do. He had alcoholic parents. His father had committed suicide. There's obviously the depressive, you know, addictive gene running in that side of the family. One job he had to do, break that cycle. And, it, yeah. and not only did he fail to break the cycle, he actually raised the stakes. There was no domestic violence or um, physicality to my dad's upbringing. He was just, he lived with pompous alcoholics himself. Uh, you know, it was actually worse for us. My mum was a tyrant. We were all physically abused at, at the hands of my mum. And, you know, look, I, I had a little revelation, Chris. I, I saw the three of us in a club together, me, my dad and my brother, because we were all in, um, oh, my God, mum's a tyrant. She treats us badly. We're a team, right? And, but you know what? In very recent years, I, I've come to resent my dad for that. He wasn't a child. I'd projected my feelings of fear and powerlessness onto a soldier, a grown man, an adult. He had no right to be in that club with me. And I'm what a coward. He never pointed that out. He was happy to have our protection. A soldier. I, two tours of Ireland, Falklands. 
using his children as human shields because he just wanted to protect his codependent alcoholic relationship. I, I, but he was a victim. He was a victim of domestic abuse. I, I, I don't think that would have happened if he hadn't been an alcoholic. Mm. If he, and so I, I, I felt very sorry for him. But his circumstances weren't my circumstances. He had, you know, looking in now, I escaped my, you know, I left my first marriage. It wasn't great. You get up, you do something about it. You don't stay there and let your children suffer. We used to beg him. We used to say, Dad, we'll come and live with you. We'll live with you, Dad. Never made a move. Never made a move. And people say they can't understand how these battered women can stay with their husbands. Well, I can't understand how a, a competent, decorated soldier can end up in that situation. More yes. shameful to him than the alcoholism, I think. We just live under one big dis delusion, don't we, in, in this life? Because... And again, for friends at home, I, I, I'm not here to slag anyone off or upset anyone. I'm here for, for, for my son's generation. And if it means I've got to look at myself in a mirror in order to tell the truth, I'll, I, maybe I'm blessed. No, no, we're not blessed, Chris. I tell you what, it's a bloody struggle, right? Those of us who get clean, there is no, it's very hard to get someone else to want to get clean. What's the prize? Yeah, you might be a bit euphoric for, for the first year when you're, yeah, you're, but then real life kicks in. It's full of struggles. It's full of pain. You don't feel good all the time, but you make a choice to dig in and be switched on and do the best you possibly can. You don't, once you take a drink, you switch off. You're not helping yourself and you're not helping anybody. And, and it's legal. <laughs> The delusion I wanted to point out in this case, Alex, is that, you know, soldiers aren't heroes. We need to get over this, this myth. Yes, yeah. they, yes, they, they will do heroic acts in the spur of the moment. People will do stuff that will surprise you and probably surprise themselves. And, and they get their, their trinkets to make sure that the, you know, You're right, Chris. It's a job title, not a, a personality. Yeah. <laughs> and when you see someone who's drunk themselves to death when they've had all the warnings, everyone's oh. told them to stop. And th this, I think this is what's hurting you, Alex, is there's one thing having a problem saying, listen, I accept it. I, I Please help me. I will try. I'll slip back occasionally, but I will, I, I, you know, I will... I understand this is not good. Well, I never, I never slip back, Chris. I've got to tell you, once I changed train night tracks, you know, yeah. February 17th, 2007, boom. I'm a parent, right? And so I was cushioning my, that choice to cushion myself so that I could cope with my pain and deliver as a parent. Um, it's not delivering. You're not there. You're not present. Mm. And warts and all, people can have good days and bad days. It, it's okay. It's part of life. And, and you have to develop. I was practicing resilience for years. Not the best thing. I, I, I've um, I practiced radical acceptance now, which is very different. And so that struggle to, to be something, to stay something. You don't actually need that. It requires so much effort, the little bit of bendability that says, I'm just going to trust myself. Um, I will never not think of myself as an addict, Chris. Um, people around me got bored with me talking about it. You know, I'm 10 years clean of, <laughs> yeah, what? Um, I don't say, I don't use words like that. I, I don't say clean because I was never dirty. All I ever was was a fucking legend. You weren't a smackhead, right? Oh, no, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't use words like that. You know, there was a rating within the kind of when I was a, a, a drug. And don't get me wrong, I was, um, I was again much like a functioning alcoholic. I had a great career. I had a, 
you know, I was a functioning member of society. I was not, you know, down and out or anything. I myself was in a codependent relationship, but I worked, I, I had done my degree. I was successful. I never stopped. Much like that model put down by my mum and dad and their alcoholism, I was a drug taker with great control. I could yeah. go to work, do my jobs. But that's... Um, there's no replacement for this that I feel now, this, this life force, this energy, this, I thought I was making myself better by switching off. You can never reach this place without stopping whatever that crutch is and just finding out what's on the other side. I don't do fear. Keeping on drinking, keeping on using is a fear based decision because you don't think you can be any different you can <laughs> just like that just like the, that the problem is we we live in a fear base you know it's not the people that decide the fear it's it's, it, it's this is an agenda we're all placed under um you've only got to go in a supermarket at the moment to see how people are behaving to understand they all live in fear yeah right they're not they're not warrior legends like us they they get their information from a black box they believe it because they don't understand how the world works and then they're willing to put that shit on the next generation yeah. and, and then and then if you were to dare say that they're bad parents for brainwashing their children into a lifetime of fear and false science and all this this not you know they they they'd be abhorrent at you how how dare you say i'm at what you've just you smother your kids in a certain jail five times a day. You don't think that's child abuse. Mm. Right? It, 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 but this is my kind of anger coming out, but it, but it doesn't mean that I don't understand it still. It, I mean, I've been, I, I relate so well to everything you're, you're saying, but then I also picture Let's not use anyone as an example, Let, but let's picture Dave, who came from a generation where everything was brushed under the carpet, including child abuse, where alcohol was what men did, real men, they drink, right? Mm. Where Dave's father wasn't adverse to belting him around the head and telling, telling him he was useless and that he'd never amount to anything and and and... You know, no, no praise, never any like, well done, son. I love you, son. You get in there and smash it. So not, none of that. Just. And then Dave grows up, like takes on the traits of that father. And then this is go. This is the intergenerational yes. thing. Right. And when you see Dave behave in the way his dad did, then it's it. You can see they're both victims. Yeah. They're both victims. And then it's like as, as much as it upsets us and it's frustrating and it's just desperate. It, we have to remember, you know, you can only exercise power if you have it. And well, look, Chris, you, if, you know, yeah, I these terms that so like you say, so much is to do with mindset. Victim. I don't do that one. Survivor. Mm -hmm. I don't do that one life experiencer right yeah. that's what we all are we're all just experiencers i don't do victim or survivor mm. um because i think we all share very similar stories you know i don't think one of us goes through anything more sensational than any other family uh, whether it be alcohol or drugs or abuse or crime or whatever it might be. Um, and people just need to start talking about. We, we are at an age now where this this kind of. Um, protecting children has, has become key, has it not? Everyone's talking about keeping children safe. And the thing is, they think they won't need to keep them safe from a paedophile and a predator. No, we need to look in our own houses first. We need to look in Check here, yourself. Don't we? Check yourself. Mm. You know, do a little recce on yourself. If, if, if quite often it's like, how, what would you advise a friend to do? So you remove yourself. So, you know, 
imagine that you're looking, this is not your life, you're looking in on Dave's life. What do you think about Dave's life? Is Dave doing right by his kids? Is Dave a stand-up bloke? People don't look at themselves. And when they do, they quite often lie into themselves about what's there rather than actually taking a good look. And we're all rough diamonds, Chris. We're all salvageable. We're all savable. And you're right, none of us. Um, Can I just chip in, at, at Alex? Because, you know, the, 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 let's talk about Dave again. Like the biggest blocker for Dave is he's what we call, and you, you know this from the cycle of change, Prochaska and De Clemente, for anyone that wants to look that up, it's the most, next to alkaline diet, is the most important thing to understand on this planet, cycle of change. Well, what we know is you have to accept you've got a problem before you can take action. Mm. But for Dave's generation, it you didn't, they, oh, I get people on my, oh, so i got to be careful what I say here. I get people that are upset when they think that their alcoholism is going to be exposed and people might think of them as an alcoholic. I can't explain to them that should be your biggest badge of honour, right? Your mother nature's chosen ones. They, she won't choose anyone to go through the pain that you're going to go through. She's challenging you because she can see you deserve a better life. Some people make it through the addiction like ourselves and we, we get that paradise. I, I live in paradise every day, right? I yeah, but paradise get... is a garden that grows weeds on a daily basis. And that's the thing, this sort of, um, you know, being drug free, it, it's not all, it's not wonderful. It doesn't give you any different to life. <laughs> it doesn't change your circumstances, but boy, it can make you feel good about yourself when you make that change. You have something to grow. You have something to nurture and develop. And quite often people are, are doing these drugs and drink because they don't have anything to nurture. They're, they're shut down. They're, they're stunted. They don't see hope. They don't yes. see something to nurture. And they can nurture themselves with just the the. What do we need? More sanctuaries, Chris. Uh, you know? But we're, more... we're helping people around, Alex, because people will be listening to this that are in what in the old days they called denial, right? Yeah, but I don't drink a bottle of whiskey before I go to work, so I can't have a problem with alcohol. Yeah, right? my right? parents right? were like that. Yeah. People listening now will know, um, excuse me, you don't, it, you could have one glass of wine, but if that one glass of wine once a week, throws your life out and you start doing up, neglecting your duties and responsibilities to yourself and and others and and by that I include that is the definition yeah. of addiction that yeah. one glass away it's not it's not the person lying in the gutter every day had a had that 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 the point that they were aiming to my dad's disposition would change mm. you know if there wasn't um and Sundays, that was a free for all. But yes, it was it was very regimented drinking, so that it looked above board. Oh, it, there was yeah. nothing sneaky about it. Cocktails, In fact, it, cocktails at half past two, and all the sons past yeah. the doodah. It's you know, it yeah. was legitimate. Yeah, but it, it wasn't, and it it meant made they were. Look, my brother calls this a form of child abuse because of the drinking timetable. Dinner, we didn't get dinner until about quarter to eight. And my, my brother looks back at that, right, as a, a hungry, growing sort of 10, 11, 12-year-old. He states that as child abuse. He was like not getting any food until quarter to eight at night because they need to fit in their drinking. Now, I've never been much of an eater, so it, that, that, never, that was not on my radar, the fact that we weren't actually getting fed until they'd had their... You know, I would never not, I could not feed my kids until quarter to eight at night. They, they want their dinner at our fall, Chris, you know? Yeah, we've got to remem remember, though, Alex, this is, if, if people want to call it an illness, they can. It's not an illness in that terms, folks. It's a psychological, it's psychological programming. That's what addiction is. I know because I've unprogrammed myself. I've never been to any self-help group. I've never been to a doctor. If I did. I just tell them to fuck off because I, I ate other people, right? I've done everything myself, all the research, the theory, 
the, the working as, as as a specialist, as I say. Um, but we just got to be so careful. I don't want to stigmatize people that 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 are experiencing I, addiction. I love this man, right? I love him. It was my dad. I love him. No stigma. Mm. A lot of this I've a lot of this I've only been able to conclude since he's died. And he's not here anymore because I'm so full of compassion and I'm a, a good human being. And I only really considered the impact that his actions or lack of actions had on my life after he passed away. Whereas I, I wasn't mean, actually free to, I didn't feel free to judge him at all. I, I saw his pain and trauma. But then when he wasn't alive, I, it, it did make me really think about how unsafe my childhood was. And I, how I was honouring him, honouring him in his death, doing right by his ashes, doing right by his, by his military history, having to see all these cards come through the door telling me this man's a legend. Oh, what went down in 82? Oh, I don't care, Colonel, this, that and the other. I don't care. My dad was a legend to you. He was a, a wobbly legged drunk who pissed himself, <laughs> who died with no carpet in his bedroom because he couldn't have carpet in his bedroom anymore because he pissed it too many times. Who didn't, who, who didn't eat because his, his esophagus had, had been repaired but he still wouldn't use it. He would hide his food in doggy poop bags and, and, and secrete them around the property. Uh, it was like a long suicide, Chris, the longest suicide mission that a human being could embark on with a predictable end. And nothing, nothing I, we could do. They stayed in this little club together until the very end. And we tried to rescue him. We'd... Uh, it try no thinking that if we could take the domestic element away, separate him and my mum, then we could regrow my dad. You know, they have money. We said, look, we got to the point where where we were saying, look, don't you don't need this money, spend it. Let's put him into one of these really good rehabilitation centres. You know, so a he gets away from mum, <laughs> and b someone can actually talk to him he never talked Chris he never talked he never talked about his service he never talked about his emotions he never talked what a, he never talked let, let's talk about his service thing because the Falklands is a big old thing for anyone to go through was he on the ground over there I look um I'll be quite honest with you my dad my dad left to go to the Falklands on the eve of my ninth birthday. And he came in and woke me up. And I've been trying to piece together the sense of it ever since. My dad left on the 10th of April to go to the Falklands by helicopter or army plane because he woke me up to give me a birthday present I was going off to boarding school after the Easter holidays so didn't know when I was going to see him and I think he I think maybe he was going to do some parachuting because he was exhilarated and nervous and talking to me about this plane dad's going in a <laughs> you know one of these planes where they leave the doors open <laughs> and I asked him to bring me back a piece of cloud um uh, anyway I, I often think of that because he was going off to do something, Chris, to do with the Falklands. He didn't go on a ship. I know that he couldn't stand the smell of lamb ever again after returning from the Falklands. If my mum ever wanted to roast a lamb chop, my dad was sick to his stomach. And I know that links with the Falklands somehow. He never said a word, Chris. In fact, as, an, as a young adult, asking him about the Falklands, he, he, my dad told me, I've never seen active service, he said, and off he went. So I don't know. I know he was there. I know he didn't go on a ship. <laughs> I know that he left on the 10th of April and that it didn't end until June. But I can't tell you. Do we, well, can we, um, can we say what, what, he was on army, um, well, again, Chris, 
Is it? This is my dad went to Sandhurst, right? Hmm. Um, so that would have been he went to Campbell's College, Northern Ireland. So he was a sort of uh, army, you know, in the making there. Went to Sandhurst and he joined. He was a, an Ulsterman. So that was very difficult back in the day. And he joined the Sherwood and Worcester Foresters at the time. That was his, um, the Woofers. And then a very strange service history, Chris. So he was obviously in Brecon, 71, to meet my mum uh. in this garrison town. <laughs> That's why I'm back here. I'm born in 73 in Berlin. My brother's born in 75 in Colchester. There was bits of Salisbury. Dover, Northern Ireland, um, Nottingham. But at times, so when we served the second tour in Northern Ireland, my dad was a UDR officer, all the little things to go with that. But then when we went back to Berlin in around 1984, my dad served with the Royal Hampshires as a major with the Royal Hampshires. So I can't even get a proper handle on exactly, exactly well, why my dad didn't. I know the woofers amalgamated and or whatever eventually, but I don't know why my dad was passed around like some sort of floating major who could <laughs> be over here with them or over there with them. So, like I say, I can't really talk about his soldiering, can I? He never really discussed it with us. And these were, this was his army life. Strange things, why has he got a, why is Fiji in his passport? Why would my dad ever go to Fiji? It wasn't a family thing. I don't know why he went to Fiji. <laughs> I don't know, Chris. Yeah, I was gonna say, why would anyone go to Cornwall? <laughs> I don't know. Um, All he ever said about the Falklands was, it stunk, it stunk. Basically, all he had to say, it stunk. And he no. told his children he'd never seen active service, but he left home to go by helicopter or army plane or something on the 10th of April from Dover. And I mean, I didn't see him again then until, well, I can't remember when the next time I saw him was, to be honest, because of boarding schools and holidays. So I don't know, Chris, yeah. to be quite honest. And, and let's talk about his childhood. Do you think that he was a... But Ireland would have been, because of, because being an Irishman, Yeah. Um, I think he wanted to join the RUC, but his dad had been the youngest ever chief of the RUC and had shot himself with his service gun. Ah, when, how, old, how old was your my dad? My dad was 17. My dad was yeah. 17 and his dad shot himself. Um, so look, these sorts of, when I look at my dad, when I just assess him as a, I had to get to grips with his, with the bits of soldiering that I can. And there was obviously great conviction there to want to stand for his country and his perceived countrymen at the time. So I, I think a lot of the, the difficulties were Northern Ireland. My dad was in Northern Ireland, early 70s. He was an Irishman anyway, and that was very difficult in the British Army. And then... I think I'm just trying, I'm not trying to be like Mr. Psychologist or anything, but like if his dad took his own life, clearly he there was some mental issues going on there and they wouldn't have just come up like that. They would, this is something from childhood. So then... So what I'm trying to say is all through your dad's parenting, there's obviously an issue he's that's coming down to him. Um, many of us join the forces with these child this with this childhood trauma, and then of course Oh, he ran, he ran into the he ran into the forces. Yeah. My dad, I mean, whether the, I mean, when I look at the history in Ireland at the time, it's funny, there's two brothers, my dad and his brother. His brother had no interest. He went off to uni, chasing girlfriends, looking for money. My dad was obviously very deeply influenced by what was happening in Northern Ireland and felt that, you know, th those were steps that he, he couldn't not take. 
Mm. So I appreciate there's, there's, a, there's a human with conviction. But then to weigh that up against the, the lack of conviction when it comes to looking after your own children, it, it, it's hard. Yes. And you said the particular incident, the, the two signalers getting murdered had a, had a devastating effect on his mental health. He just left the service, Chris, and we were, myself and dad had gone to Porth Call on a recce to buy the house they were going to live in. He had a job to go to, uh, shit jobs, obviously. <laughs> um, and we were in a bed and breakfast on our own, me and dad. I think I might have been enrolled in the school as well or something. And so at night, it was just him and I sitting in the living room in the bed and breakfast the bed and breakfast owner had given my dad the key to the bar so that he could keep his own tally of his whiskies at night and what have you on an honesty basis. We were watching the news and they were showing live footage of, and I, I should know their names, sorry, um, those two soldiers getting pulled out of the car. Well, yeah, I made sure I made a note of it. Derek, of Derek, Derek Wood and David Howes. Yeah, please, please do. Um, and everything changed. I, I didn't know who I was sitting in a room with. He went to the bar, he just got the bottle, he took it back and he was gone. I, you know, just gone. Now, I don't know whether you want to say this or not. I was so confused, Chris, by not understanding. I, I didn't relate what was on the telly particularly. I knew um, it was a, an abhorrent situation. I'm glad I couldn't quite fully comprehend it. And dad had gone somewhere. Look, I remember later that week, my dad was such a stranger to me that I went nosing around his room, right? Looking for clues, you know? I'm 13 at the time and I don't know what's going on. I'm somewhere with my dad. I, everything's very strange. He's drinking. And so I go through his room and I, he has this little brown suit, army suitcase that always went with him everywhere. I open this suitcase and I find pornography. <laughs> First time I've ever found pornography. I, I rang my mum and she was very sort of calm. He, your dad's a soldier. They, they carry this stuff. <laughs> she sort of just said that. But um, I, look, I wish I'd never gone nosing, Chris, because now when I think about the impact that that little issue would have had on top of an already really complicating, traumatic time for my dad. So I already felt this man had disappeared and I didn't know who he was. And then suddenly he turned into, um, what is this? Huh? I, I mean, you know, it was the first time I'd ever seen pornography, which... I'm sure it is, but you know, um, I feel a bit differently about that now. And it was nothing, may I say, it was probably your run of the mill, nothing, uh, nothing too bad, but boobs. <laughs> they weren't my mum's. <laughs> and so that was quite hard to understand. And But he never came back from that. And I mean, he'd left the forces. So you've got to understand his very early days it's, of Sydney Street, he'd had his... He'd had his six-week builders course and was chucked out, you know, and and then he's on his own, on his own watching this. I, um, yeah. So for sure. our friends at home who who aren't familiar with what we're talking about, it was two corporals undercover in Belfast, and there's various different theories on who they were working for, if you get what I mean. But at the time. They How they helped. ended up there, and yeah. yeah. At the time, they were. Um, it was said they were said to be signalers, and the story at the time was that one the 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 more senior signaler who'd been in Belfast for some time was showing the new guy around, undercover car, undercover clothes, pistols tucked down the front of their jeans, and they accidentally unknowingly drove into an IRA funeral cortege and it was all captured on camera not just locally but also there was a, a, a police an aerial yeah police helicopter in the air yeah. and and it didn't stop any of it from happening did no it? one of them fired a warning shot and everyone backed away immediately 
and then they swarm back on the car. There was a close-up shot that showed the magazine tumbling out of one of the corporal's weapons. So they reckon he'd trying to take the um, safety catch off. He'd accidentally inadvertently clicked the magazine release catch. Um, and cut long so short, they dragged them out, stripped them. I, 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 when we, I mean, I watched that footage a few years ago when I was sort of deep diving on my dad after he'd gone. And um, I don't know what those guys could have done any different. You oh. know, we look at it, it's, ag it's agonising, absolutely agonising. But you, you, you can't see a way around it. I, I don't know how. Yeah, it was. It, oh. This this happened literally. This was before we deployed to Belfast, so exactly the same location. At that time, we were doing our build-up training when this happened. Our, one of our corporals, Jam, brought the paper in and went, "Look at this, boys." And we were looking at the, this funeral crowd um, to pick out the faces of the guys we're going to see in 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 a month's time, right? Um, the Sim, a tiny little things like one of the corporals. So they've both been stripped off. They've been brutally tortured. Ham, you know, rocks chucked at them. All this sort oh, of stuff. Savage, and then, savage. Yeah, and then they were uh, executed in in a place called Penny Penny Lane. But right just before his execution, one of the corporals just got up and still tried to make a, and and it. It's something, it's things like that, Alex, that are like, oh, God, could you imagine the fear of knowing? Well, I, I wonder if it is fear. Look, I mean, I don't know too much about what my dad did in Ireland. Probably not meant to know. But I do remember that there is um, one of the times living over there, dad didn't look like dad, right? <laughs> my mum used to say it was the most handsome he'd ever been, right? <laughs> mm. Flares. My dad was wearing denim flares, right? And big bushy, choppy things and a tash and his hair was grown and wild. So whether he had an acute awareness of um, being in plain clothes and uh, being rumbled or being in an uncomfortable setting or, you know, I would imagine my dad had some use with his Irish accent and his Irishness. Mm. And um, so who knows? I, I think I think he was re-traumatised on a very personal level, mm. uh, as opposed to the horrificness that any of us see well, he, when we he, watch this. I think there was yeah. a very personal connection with not being in uniform. <laughs> Somewhere where you didn't want to be yeah. found it, it's in his, Ireland. It's his, he's watching his worst fear come true. Yeah. And it's may, it may as well be him there because even as someone, even as someone as detached as I was, because I hadn't been in um, active service by then, I hadn't been in Belfast, but even I, Alex, can tell you I was that, I was one of those guys. Especially when they but, said, but "This is this is not an unforeseen. You're soldiers. Don't the army do anything with you to to realise that you guys must be living with trauma as part of that job, indoctrinated trauma to help them, your own personal trauma, given what you might have to encounter when you're serving." There should be a system in place, Chris. A duty well, of care. The, the, why? The, why are they not? Why is that not my workplace offer free counselling? I'm an administrator in a national park, for God's sake. My workplace offer free counselling. Yeah, well, the systems, the system in place then was take your pistol out and you fucking shoot someone. But they didn't, did they? And, and I'm not saying that would have saved them because you've only got nine rounds in that magazine. I don't know how many backups they would have carried but even even if it was three they those rounds will i think you'd pretty much keep one round for your for yourself, yourself because it's just quicker and easier to do that than to go through what those guys had to but had i been them i would have gone right sorry one of you's got to fucking have it and and hopefully that would have kept them off 
until the troops could have got there on the ground. But I don't know. Like I say, I've heard different stories about who these guys actually were in, mm. in respect to their professionalism. If they were signalers, they they could have been sloppy soldiers. Sorry, I don't mean that. I mean that. No I, I know. I've heard that, that it know, was a bit of a, a show off. Trip they they, they the might park. not have been. But this is the trouble with the British Army, Chris. They bloody shaft you. They're quite happy for people to believe lies, but they're quite happy to trot out these stories, especially in Ireland. They're quite happy to say, oh, shonky soldier, bad soldier. Uh, you know, it's, it's very uncomfortable. It is, yeah. It's an it's uncomfortable climate to, to see this coming down. And I've, I've got my own moral take on, <laughs> on Ireland. But then I have my, I'm sorry, but you, 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 there should be a certain amount of protection from your employer. But what we're discovering here with the trauma and the alcoholism is that there's no, there's no looking after the welfare in this organisation. Did the British Army ever get sued, Chris? Has anybody ever actually gone back to them and said, you were a really shit employer and you didn't look after me? Yeah, I mean, people tried to sue, sue them after the Gulf, didn't they? Because the, I, the I, I, I'm, not, I'm not aware. Well, it's that thing, isn't it? If it starts a president, the, the military don't want that, do they? Because if one person manages to sue them because their Land Rover didn't have our... I remember our, that when my dad's hearing, they were busy trying to say that people were deaf bloody years ago yeah. so they could not have to pay out for that when and we, pressure was put on individual soldiers not to pursue those claims you know pressure a lot of pressure in there yeah when we when we arrived in in ireland belfast northern ireland depending i don't get involved in all that that politics it's not my place but we arrived there we didn't wear helmets we just had our berries on right and then the unit before us had put in so many claims for head damage from, from rocks, from being bricked. That they not, forced you to stick and, them on. And then. a lot of them were like, mate, mate, smack me in the head, smack me, oh. you know, get your SA and smack you. I'm not saying we did that, but the unit before us um, did. Anything you got, like if you tripped on the pavement and smashed your face on the curb, that was a kid's just. But that, that culture is indicative of a bad employer. Because if you've got an employer who's taking care of you, you don't take the piss because well, you're already well looked after. If you've got an employer who's not looking after you, you might try and, you know, fleece a, a bonus here or there if you're not actually looked after. Well, yeah, I don't know how much to get into that because... We, we but you're right, soldiers are just people. Well, so we were scallywags. We and, were scallywags. Um, if you good. could get away with getting a 500 quid here or there or in the case of the brickins people were getting like five grand you know what one guy did actually get set to see me on our in in our in our company and he was on life support and everything right um but anyway the thing was the previous unit put so many claims in that our unit after two weeks honeymoon period we all had to wear helmets then mm. <laughs> and um but Yes, I, I would imagine. So they that, do react. So there is a reaction. Well, only only because they want to save the money, isn't it? That's the main. So if people started, if people started saying, you didn't look after me and my mental health suffered and I'm an addict and you didn't support me, could you see a movement? I mean, it would be. An, but how do you get this employer? Because that's what they are. They're a very big employer. How do you get them to look after their staff? Well, it's not going to happen, is it? And we're seeing that now with the Northern Ireland veterans who are getting hammered. There's... The military can't be... It has to serve a function. I say this a lot. Everyone know, you know, you've just got to look at the last 20 years of conflict to see who the military serve. Yeah, and and, and unless, unless you're utterly... Like, you like to live in a delusion it hasn't been us that they've been serving has it you know but it i don't think these and armies have ever worked on behalf of the people chris they no, work on I behalf mean, of you, power you, don't you, they so. you have it possibly exceptions i mean the, the falklands isn't it you know i wouldn't want to say the but even that's got dodgy starting ground well it, then, so. then, there, then then there is and you know who's there is benefiting and oh i don't know but 
The but so while you... they're in existence, I'm not talking about whether it's a good or a bad thing, having the forces, who's bidding they're doing, but they are an employer. They are an employer. I and don't understand. duty of care to their employees. I, I don't yeah, understand that yeah. they can skip that. Yeah, they're, they're, they are an employer and you're right. And the reason we're having this conversation today is they're an employer that promotes drug alcohol. abuse. Dr- Most drug, employers no, let, have, a, have a, no, a, a no alcohol. My employer wouldn't tolerate me can't be smelling of alcohol or being a bit. I'm not allowed to drink during my working hours. I have policies that protect my welfare and my employer from me being not able maybe to do my job or interface or look after myself. Yeah. It's substance abuse, isn't it? Drug abuse, substance abuse It, it, it on a massive scale. And it's condoned by the employers. So this is this is why. Do they feed you guys properly, Chris? Because obviously diet is very important to you and I oh. probably now. And, you know, what, what you eat. Are, are people given the chance to be mentally healthy? Obviously not when you're active on active service, but normally is it good good catering? Do they actually give you guys a chance to to be the best you can? I went vegetarian for a period when I was in, right, which was almost unheard of. Right. And when the chef saw me helping myself to veggies and and not having a, he just leant across and went, Royal, can I do you something special? You're vegetarian, aren't you? And I said, yeah. He said, oh, right, just just let me know and I'll do you. They they were absolutely exceptional. I can only talk about the, well, the Royal Royal Marines chefs were just brilliant absolutely brilliant on ship they were wonderful as well um i'm not talking maybe you know i'm a big i practice alkaline living now so my diet's very different now to what it was as a young man where i just eat anything you know give me 10 egg banjos in an evening i think nothing of doing my dad loved those you know knocking them back but then you got the RAF with their massive budget and it just gets ridiculous. It's like eating at the Ritz or something. OK. All right. Well, that's good because, you know, so there's, there's less excuses for it then. But <laughs> People it should have the be, mental clarity to know. It needs to be. I mean, alcohol, it's not just the forces in society. We need to acknowledge it's an incredibly dangerous chemical. And. We're all labouring under delusions because these delusions, these narratives, these these brainwashing is in, they all serve a certain function in society. And that's not for your benefit or mine, is it? Because mm. we're the ones that end up dying on a you know kidney failure. It serves the 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 it serves the so power. What, as a as a as a as a scenario, Chris, remove alcohol. What would what would the army, how would, they would notice that if, if their servicemen weren't self-medicating, they, they would have to come up with something to replace yeah, that. Ooh. Yeah, but I think we also need to point out that it, it was of its time. It's allegedly, and I say that because I, you know, I've been out of it a long time now, but I am told this massive drink into destruction culture is not quite what it was when I served. Okay. Um, when you meet the younger, I mean, they've just extended training at Limston by a month. And the reason for that is youngsters are rocking up there and they, they've never seen anything like it. They, you know, that. Uh, so, and for anyone listening, this is not knocking young people. This is just being honest about how life is now. It's changed. There's a massive agenda. They're pretty to... sedentary, are they, Chris? Pretty well, sedentary when they rock up. No, I don't think sedentary is the right word. They're just mollycoddled. So they'll write to me and say, Chris, you know, I've got to move away from home. Can you give me any advice? And I say, I resist the temptation of saying, it's, a, you know, that's... If you're asking me, you're not ready. <laughs> No, I resist the temptation of being honest and saying, like, if you think that's your problem, you wait, you've got to shove a bayonet through someone's throat. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's, that's the thing that's going to screw you up for life because you're a softy and you want to be a hard man. And there isn't really any much thing because the blokes you think are the hardest 
They're the ones that end up drinking themselves to death because they're not odd. They're just human like everybody else. On a constructive note, Chris, I did have a, a little thing there. When my dad was a younger man, so serviceman in his 20s and what have you, and 30s, exercise, he did sports, right? He was into hockey, windsurfing. I remember windsurfing in Swindeby Gravel Pit with him or somewhere, God knows where. And when he had that balance, he was happier and he drank less because he would actually be engaged in something. And the sport element, we, I think if he'd, if he'd been able to maintain that, it really would have helped balance the rest of his lifestyle. And when that door shut, so, I mean, that's key for anybody, key for me, access to the outside, walking, exercise, breathing properly, <laughs> expelling my carbon dioxide, getting as much oxygen in me as I can, you know? Feeling alive and exercise or is very good for that. And that that stopped for my dad. So I would just say to anybody, it, it doesn't have to be physical. If you if you have mobility issues, it can be anything that just changes the way you breathe, you know, it can be done. Um it brings you back to self, it, it involves self-mastery. And it can feel very good and it can be hard to be left without a crutch. And I, I, I think exercise, outdoor stuff, pets, <laughs> whatever it may be, they're really helpful. You don't want to leave people thinking, well, I've got to put down the bottle and then what? Then everything, then everything. Yes. So I want to finish up here Alex on, on, on two things um and my dad never got the love of his grandchildren there we are he was he was such an alcoholic that mm. there no love no no very 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 hard for him I accepted it my kids aren't even aware of what they didn't have but for a, for a man to become a grandparent and fail to even really notice that such a shame that the love connection are you, Alex are you gonna forgive him because I did forgive him and and this is the thing I forgave him I, I never blamed him about... until after he was dead and he had my forgiveness and I told him during the week in which he was dying that I forgave him and I was with him when he took his life I was the only one with him I spent all that time with him and it was very difficult but I actually wanted to see um there was a treat in it. When my dad's liver went, um, about three days before the end, he got delirious, right? He had this sort of thing that happens where apparently they, they go a bit delirious. And he was the most animated that I'd seen him in 20 years. He was laughing and talking. There was a full being in there. Um, and it was the service. He was doing this strange thing with his blanket. That's the only thing I wanted to ask you, Chris, is there a bit of kit or what might he have been doing? The blanket on his bed, in a very precise way, he kept doing this fold, 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 pleat, like he was putting some sort of kit away or something. And I wondered if you knew what that might be. Just this sort of pleating, pleating, very exact folding over but it it wasn't the blanket he was doing that with a bit of kit he was talking about being a bad stooge he was um and then ordering drinks because he thought he was on a cruise <laughs> I'm not ready to order yet <laughs> he said to the nurse yeah off his head but that for me was a bit of joy because I hadn't seen him smile laugh or be animated for two decades possibly mm. so I actually in, enjoyed that my brother didn't I I really enjoyed just seeing my dad animated even though it was delusional or whatever it was but mm. to see his face light up to see a full smile to hear a voice with power in it um I, I hold that very dear 
but he was a he was a bastard Chris he he, he told me to fuck off uh, that was one of the last things he ever said to me he just wanted to die he just kept pulling the thing out of his nose I was wrestling with him um he wanted to die he wanted to die yes I just um hope you can set yourself free of this yes I forgive him I forgive him I forgive any human being but the child in me doesn't forgive him and I'm very glad that I have learned from his mistakes and that I have broken the cycle and so I may be not able to forgive him if I was still screwed up myself okay but the power of being able to do right by my children and right by myself means that I am able to forgive him. Had I been a screwed up drug taker still, no doubt I'd be like, oh, my dad's to blame. <laughs> you know, it's very easy, isn't it? No, I don't blame him. I kind of look at him now. He was a rubbish dad, Chris, but I have, I, I forgive the man. I forgive the man. Yeah, when my old man found out I was going to join the Marines, he wasn't happy. I told him I was going to have this chat, a, a, a photo of him. I, I spoke to him last night. Yeah. There he is. And I told him, I said, I'm not interested in besmirching your name. I love you. But I'm blowing the fucking doors off, Dad. Because if one person decides maybe not to take that next drink or maybe to actually assess the impact that their actions or lack of actions are having on their child then that's the price he paid <laughs> that's the price he paid for the life he led so I speak out of respect for him and I hope yes. he'd be I hope he'd be proud of this, doing what he could not do. Yeah, well, you're being the warrior that that he couldn't be, and how yeah. can you not? How can you not be proud of that? You know, it's it's easy to live in a lie, folks. You know, it's easy to just hero worship the military like they're all brilliant. You know, it's like it's some Hollywood movie or something. That's not what being a legend is. That's not what being a warrior is. What being a warrior is, is what Alex is doing now. She's protecting the children in the next generation from, from this generation's egos. And that's what it is. It's ego. It's people that can't admit that, do you know what? If people realise I've got a problem, they might. And, and it's just all such utter fucking horseshit. Mm. Like we are who we are. Life's not supposed to be perfect. It's not supposed to be easy. You will have challenges. The quicker you face up to them and say, right, right, how do I, you know, how do I, how do I deal with, that's what, that's what, you know, that's what it's all about. And if you're out there and you're struggling, if you're telling yourself, yeah, well, it's only, you know, a glass of wine. Well, not a glass of wine, two glasses of wine. Well, you know, sometimes a bottle, all right, actually, like sometimes two, you know, what, whatever. If, if, if you're having one glass of wine. If you're having to justify it yes. to yourself, perhaps have a different discussion with yourself. <laughs> yes, if, if you ever leave work and go, right, I'm going straight home, not drinking something straight. And then by the time you've got home, you've gone to the co-op and you've got yourself a bottle of red and you've justified that, oh, it's from Chile, it's cultural, it's special, it's this, it's that, or it's a... 1664 this is you know then then you have a problem with alcohol and it's okay it's okay because i've had one all my adult life and i've had the best life ever and like i say i big sympathy on that scale dropping an illegal substance is way easier than yeah. having to develop a normal relationship with something you're going to pass in the supermarket that you can pick up 24 hours a day yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm glad I didn't have to do that work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's 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 difficult for people to understand. But again, it's because no one ever talks about it. No one will ever tell you the truth. Yeah. The truth is you get addicted to a class A substance. It just creates so much havoc in your life in such a short time. 
you end up having to get it out of your life because you just can't fight it, it's it ceases to be fun life becomes so problematic and hard and painful you could one nervous breakdown is enough imagine having a nervous breakdown every bloody day it's awful and you decide do you know what i think life would actually be easier without that stuff in my alcohol this is why we herald it as the worst drug yeah is imagine you've got the worst drug in your life and you have a problem with it. Instead of helping you, all your mates go, go on, Chris, and get another one down here. Go on, no, none of this giving up nonsense. Go on. Imagine everywhere you go shopping, it they line the aisles with this poison, right? Mm. At prices that you can't say no to. How could you possibly celebrate no. Christmas or a birthday without it? Yeah. Yeah. I get, and I... I I mean, I I get approached by people and they run companies that deal in this sort of stuff, right? I'm, I'm trying not to be too specific here. And I say, no, I don't want sponsorship from you. Mm. That's the top. I, I don't blame them. Mm. They're just trying to make a, you know, they're just trying to get through love. And let's be honest, fortunately, most people don't have an issue with alcohol and, and that's fine. That's absolutely f- fine. Really, Chris? Really? Well, okay. You'd look, if we were really <laughs> honest. I think there are, a, a, I think a lot of people have a little bit of a problem, even just with regards to the mentality that it presents. Like I say, on a Friday, That's what I hear from my fellow workers on a tough day. That's what I hear from my fellow workers. That's where they're going. That's Mm. where the brain goes. It goes to their coping mechanism, their legal coping mechanism, which is actually. It's a very short term solution and life is long term if you want it. So when you engage this very short term solution, you are you're shortening your life. Yes. And the quality of your life. Yes. So. If this conversation, folks, you're thinking, ah, actually, that could apply to me a bit. It's okay. It proudest thing in my life, proudest thing I've ever done, way more than wearing a green berry is I'm an uh, I don't, I'd never use this word because I don't believe in stigmatizing language. But if for what for the purposes of this example, being an addict is the most pr- thing I'm most proud of in the world. And if you if you have a problem and you can't say what I've just said, it's because you've got some learning to do, and it's okay. And I want. You know, if you've got, and I apologize if I used any stigmatizing language, I was kind of venting from the angry child side. I'm an adult, and you know, compassion is the key. Compassion is the key. Compassion, and let's be honest, being strict, being a bit strict, and saying sorry. And being straight, we we like a bit of straight talking, Chris. I can tell that people aren't straight with themselves. You won't get straight if you don't talk straight. And it doesn't have to be, folks. You don't have to go to AA and sit in a circle and confess. No, I actually don't recommend. That's why I, th- I, I don't necessarily recommend anything that keeps you locked into an addictive mindset vortex. Uh, you know, yeah. looking at yourself. Um, like you say, stigmatizing. You need to you need to you need to see that you're, you're valuable. We're yeah. all valuable. There's other there's other groups out there. There's there's groups that use a more scientific based approach um, to what people call recovery, although I think we both hate that word. Um, and and it's and it's one day at a time. Will it will it will you get there straight as some people do? You know, Alex said she she just drew the line. Me probably knew 25 years ago my drinking was going to kill me still did it for another 25 years but when my boy came along it no longer became about me it it i i had to address it i won't say it was easy and i won't say uh i don't 
you know, I'll still go out and have a few beers. Not very rarely, folks, very rarely, because life is so much better without it. But when I go and meet the guys, which I'm due to this summer, and there's going to be 200 of us, I'll have a few beers. But uh, you're you're not drinking to to dim anything. Well, it, I'm not drinking now... on my own for a start behind yeah. closed doors. You know, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm. But I'm. But funny enough, you know, I was just chatting about this today with someone. So maybe because but maybe I have... you don't want to, Chris. Maybe you actually well, don't want to. It's being able to make a choice. How beautiful to have the mental capacity to be able to make a choice for yeah. yourself at the time based on how you're feeling. Yeah. That's the I've, most responsible way to do it, isn't it? I've done two big reunions without just sober. just And it and it's great because you can go and get yourself a kebab at 10 o'clock. But you're home, you're home in bed chatting to your girlfriend by half 10, watch a bit of telly. Have a nice night's sleep. It's all gone up, down well then, isn't it? <laughs> then you won't wake up feeling brilliant, go out for a run, and you got the whole rest of the weekend to feel ace. We all know the other scenario how you end up feeling, and the kebabs all down your face along with a load of puke and it, look, the air stuff, in but... the air in my house growing up. Are you drinking too much? What does the air smell like in your bedroom in the morning? You can very oh, it was the smell of my childhood. You can smell. There is a definite smell that is left when a body has drunk more than it can process. Yeah. It, 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 it hits the ether. It's unmistakable. Mm. So if you wake up and you're smelling that, <laughs> you are damaging your, your, your physical vessel. You are, you know, you are drinking more than your body can handle. And let's, let's also be entirely honest you haven't yet realised life is so much better without that stuff. So much better. You will not regret giving it up. You just think you will because you think you're going to miss out on something. But how can you miss out when the thing that you think you're missing out on is like way better than what you're giving yourself now? Yeah, and that's that's the point with my dad. Had he, had he not, you know, to, to not enjoy the gift of, of, of your grandchildren, to, you know, to be so trapped in an addiction that there's there's no love, you, yeah. you know, um, that's that's tragic. That's really tragic for anyone. Yeah. And, and another thing, because there'll be people going, yeah, well, I, you know, I probably drink to it, but I don't abuse my children. It's like pr it, providing it causes neglect. Pro when you drink, you become neglectful. Yeah. Uh, and you can watch that happen. You can watch that happen in a beautiful setting, just in a, in a pub beer garden. And the children are slightly less relevant than they are in a different setting. Or they're, you know, they're to be pacified or put to the side. That, that in my book, is yeah. a, a, a type of neglect already. Where's your focus? Where is your focus? Is your focus when your child's awake and with you, that's where your focus needs yeah. to be. <laughs> And just trying to clear, uh, make it clear that providing, you know, school uniforms and toys, that, that's, that's the children. Stuff, stuff children, is nothing. That's secondary. It's emotional. Do they connection. feel safe? Do they feel safe? Like, yeah. you know, it was not a safe childhood. Unpredictable, volatile, um, you know. Do you, want to know some, do you want to know something that will surprise a lot of people? Yeah. The social workers... Up there, it's either Biddeford or Barnstable. It's on. It's on the seafront, right? It's got. It's got a beach, is what I'm trying to say. They go along the beach in the summer, removing children from their parents because it's illegal in this country to be drunk in public and in charge of a child. So it should be, but I've never seen that enforced anywhere. I didn't even know it was yeah, illegal. Yeah, it, it, I did some. Um, I studied social work at uni and one of my placements was in North Devon and, and I sat down, I sat in a meeting and this social worker went, yeah, every summer we have a patrol that goes along the beach with the police because people just get out of their heads. I mean, we're not talking here having a, a beer or something. We're talking about when people are noticeably drunk mm. and they got their children with them. And yeah, it's you. Ironically, you can be 
slaughtered and lying on the floor in your own vomit. And that's not illegal. I mean, OK, it's it's abuse. Of course it is. And social work would get involved if they knew that. But technically, that scenario's not going to get you arrested. But 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 this one, well, it's it's a it's 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 a poison, isn't it? It's a poison. It's. um. And the thing is, you know, it's not to stigmatize servicemen. It just so happens those are my circumstances. This is a societal problem. The yeah, use we're of all, alcohol. We're, it's just that servicemen may be, um, like I say, I believe they're being let down by their employer, and they're more. And you're going to definitely have some element of traumatization, even just through being conditioned to to act like a soldier, regardless of what action you see when you're doing your soldiering. So you know the the, the risk assessment says these guys are. This is not guys, obviously, but this this is a vulnerable section. This is a vulnerable employment section. And um, but no, this is a society. This is a society culture. Just look at Westminster, for God's sake, even during lockdown, they didn't shut all their bars, did they? That's the way the power does their business. Uh, you know, from the top down, we are it's instilled in us that booze is part of society. So, yes not just a soldier's problem. So Alex, stay on the line so I can thank you properly, but for okay. the purposes of the podcast, massive thank you for coming on and sharing your story. It's a very brave thing to do, um, but then maybe it's not brave. Maybe it's just, there's so many people that are a bit cowardly about this sort of thing that would rather let the children be abused than admit I've actually got a problem or my parents had a problem or, 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 or whatever. But I, Irregard, irregardless or regardless, whichever your choice of word is, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I know it's a credit to yourself that you've turned out so well balanced for your children. To our friends at home, if 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 this is affecting you, reach out to somebody. You can speak to your GP, although. My experience is they will they very often just signpost to AA, which isn't always mm-hmm. helpful because if you're the local bank manager, you might not want to sit in a room full of you, you know your clients going, I'm a this, I'm a that. And but there, there are you can ask them for the the alternative type type groups. Mm-hmm. Um, you can speak to life coaches and see what they recommend you could just speak to a life coach in general to get some some balance in you know into into your own own life you can are there better better and support groups or or things like that chris yes you can reach out to there's a plethora plethora of um, veteran support groups there's many i know we have SAF around here yeah uh, yeah. there's many on 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 facebook and this sort of thing and and um you can obviously just request for things to be dealt with discreetly if 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 it's going to put you in an awkward sort of situation um you can speak to people who have been there and just be open-minded and accept that you have a challenge it's not a problem it's not an issue it's just a challenge you have a challenge that you need to tackle and then you can go and speak to your friend who's been there with an open mind instead of going, oh, well, that, you know, I, I, that's not me. Oh, I only drink a bottle of whiskey, you know, three times a day. It's, and we, we, as you can tell, we've heard it all before. It's yeah. it, the only person you're kidding is yourself. And yeah, it's, it's sad. I, my, I've said this a lot. My, two of my best friends i've got my little group of best friends in this life two of them drank themselves to death and it's in front of your eyes you see it you go to visit them that one last time and it's not it's not a pretty sight and you know you're never going to see them again well next time you're going to see them they're going to be in a box aren't they and and it's it's so unnecessary when you consider life is so much better when you don't drink it just is i i I fought to get alcoholism put on my dad's death certificate. Mm. They didn't want to do that, Chris. Um, strange, isn't it? Multiple organ failure. Oh it, oh, it was a bit of his heart went or whatever. It's like, no, 
And so I did have alcohol related condition or something vague that didn't just say, I said, I wanted alcoholism on his death certificate, yeah. please. So that, because I don't think we're even recording or collating the statistical harm of, of alcohol. Well, I'm, I won't harp on about it now, Alex, but there's a, okay, reason, sorry. There's, there's a reason that they push alcohol at you cheaply all the time. In short, it's because it severs your connection with this beautiful universe. And the sociopaths love that because they don't want you to know the truth in life. They don't want you to know that happiness is just a decision in your head. They want None of us want to be puppets, do we? We don't want to be puppets for the, for, the, for the evil powers, do we, Chris? Yeah. Everybody, you want mastery yourself. You don't want to dance to someone else's tune. <laughs> Make your own choices. Yeah. Yes. Friends at home, please like and subscribe and support these chats because there's not many people talking about this stuff, is it? And it could be you. This could be your children next. And um, it don't hurt to be a bit of a warrior, does it? <laughs> Much love. Thank you, Chris.